<clears throat> Excellent. Well, hello, Tiger Bay members, and welcome to uh, Fiona v. Drake Part 2. Um, I email them, it's Ollie Frazier Part 2, but no one knows what that means. So um, we're, uh, we, this is backed by popular demand. Um, they, they had a, a, a great debate last time, frankly, but there were lots of other people, so uh, we thought we'd give them a little more uh, time to, to give us their views. The good news is, um, or maybe bad news, depending, is I'm going to try to do something a little different um, with this one. So normally, as you know, we have a whole bunch of questions that we get from uh, the audience and from the campaigns and from all sorts of different sources. And I try to get through as many as we possibly can. So um, this time we're going to try something a little different because that format doesn't really allow the candidates to expound much. Um, and you know, after this, we may not want them to expound much, but we're going to try this. We're going to give them a little more leeway in this debate to sort of give us their philosophy. Um, you know, there are, there are true ideological differences uh, between the parties, between the candidates, um, between governing philosophies, and, and you know, there, there's merit on all, on all sides. So uh, we just don't get to talk about it very much. So hopefully today, we are going to get to have a, a more um, intellectual conversation um, than, than we normally do. All right, so welcome back, Drake Buckman and Fiona McFarland. Drake is a fifth generation Floridian, husband, father, and lawyer from, originally from Jacksonville, Florida. He does live here now. <laughs> Might create some residency problems if you were still in Jacksonville, but he lives here. Um, and he met and married his wife, Amy, who is a Sarasota native on the banks of the Beautiful, but polluted, but getting less polluted, Philippi Creek, uh, almost 30 years ago. You don't look that old, Drake. He and Amy have raised two daughters and a son in District 72. Each of them graduated from Riverview High School, where he was a volunteer kilty dad. Did you wear the kilt? I did. All right. Man. All right. Yep. <laughs> and he, has, he, he keeps them all close together because uh, his daughters and a son-in-law have all joined uh, the firm as practicing attorneys. So um, that's, that's probably nice and bad all at the same time. Um, he's passionate about the education environment. He hates red tide and wants to be an independent and strident voice for the district, his neighbors and our schools and the legislature. Please welcome Drake Buckman. Yay. Fiona McFarland. New mom, by the way. Last time, if you remember, you were getting like baby advice halfway through. So uh, hopefully <laughs> that may happen again. I have no idea. Um, I, I just love your resume. So I'm going to read it again because it's uh, uh, impressive. Uh, glad to have you. It's United States Naval Academy graduate uh, in 2008, where she majored in political science and was captain of the women's crew team. She commissioned as an ensign in the U.S. Navy. I noticed I didn't say ensign. Got it right. All right. It's been eight years on active duty in the United States Navy. She served as a surface warfare officer, completing uh, tours of duty as an engineering officer aboard the Arleigh B B Burke. Is that Arleigh? Arleigh? You, you got it right the first time. Arleigh right. Burke. Class guided missile destroyer, the USS Preble, as an inaugural crew member on a littoral combat ship, uh, USS Conrado, as well as the Navy Office of Information in the Pentagon. While on active duty, she completed her Master's of Business Administration from the University of, Chapel University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, right? Yeah. Uh, Keenan School of Business in 2013. 2016, she became a U.S. Naval Reserve and finally married her Naval Academy graduate, uh, uh, fellow graduate Matthew Melton after all those years. Gosh, he asked and he asked. Um, I don't know if that's true, by the way. I just made that up. In the reserve, she's participated in multinational anti-submarine warfare exercises above the Arctic Circle with the U.S. European Command uh, and the U.S. Africa Command to promote cooperation and understanding. She worked at McKinsey and Company uh, before moving to Sarasota and running for office. So welcome, Fiona McFarland. Okay, so as I said earlier, um, I kind of want to. I kind of want to have a broader discussion than normal, so I'm going to start with a big picture question, and it goes like this: Fiona, your mother is KT McFarland. For those of you who don't know who KT McFarland is, um, KT McFarland was an actual member of the Trump administration for a period of time, a very active uh, politician from New York, uh, nationally known. 
Um, and I guess now has a house here, right? Is that the, does she also have a house here too? All right. She moved in with us for a time. <laughs> <laughs> for a very short period of time. Now it's pretty obvious at this point, I don't think we're um, talking out of school to say that the Republican party is at a bit of a transformational crossroads. It is uh, the party of Jeb Bush, the party of uh, the elder Bush, uh, those, that, that is in the descendant and the Trump side of the party is in the ascendancy of which your mother was a part of it. So the question I'm gonna ask to you is, where are you on that spectrum? Are you an, an, an adhere? Do you adhere to the Trump uh, policies? Do you uh, look to further that governing philosophy? Where are you? And if you're not, try to describe where you disagree with the president. Yeah, I, I, I really love this question because it's the number one thing I hear from voters is, is, is how do you feel about the president? Where do you stand with the president? It's, it's incredibly polarizing at, at right now. And I, you know, you brought up my mother, so I'll, I'll take the opportunity to talk about my family because I think it informs who I am. But uh, my mother was actually in the Nixon, Ford, and Reagan administrations and, uh, previously, and her time in office was in uh, foreign policy and national security. So she served in the Defense Department uh, and the National Security Council, which is, which is uh, you know, relatively apolitical. Um, so growing up, my view of the world was from a foreign policy lens. Yes, I was raised a Republican and I am, I continue to be a Republican, but I'm a Republican because it informs how I view government should exist in society, right? Then I went off and joined the Navy, which by, in the Navy and the military by law, you must be apolitical, right? We cannot participate in rallies, we cannot campaign, we cannot run for office, you know, all of these things. Um, we have a strict civilian control of the military, civilian military divide. Part of what makes us so great and unique is a military power. Um, so for me running for office now, it's, I, I feel as though it's my first foray into the partisan world. So yes, again, I am a Republican because I, 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 I support a limited form of government, fiscal conservatism. Um, and for me that ideologically ideologically fits most closely with the Republican Party, but I do not feel that I'm an, a, a, a browbeating ideologue, so to speak. So to your question, Morgan, of, you know, how do I, how do I respond to the questions about the president and where I stand with the president? I, um, I, I support a lot of his policies, I really do. Um, but it doesn't mean I agree with everything he says. He is merely one Republican at a big party and he's, and Yes, he's our president, and I think that there's some policies that he's enacted that are that are quite strong. And and if he and if he wins on November third and gets another four years, I you know there's there's some policies I'd like to um, see him continue. Uh, but it but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm I'm here to to defend the president all day long. I, I like to think of myself as as independent. Well, then let me ask a follow up question. So uh, again, we'd be naive to to think that the Republican Party and I'm going to get to you, Drake, don't worry. Um, it, it isn't driven by the Trump wing. So we have primaries against moderate Republicans. Um, can you survive in the Republican Party claiming to be an independent? I mean, it's it's kind of an on off switch these days. Of you're either for him or against him. Well, I've survived so far. <laughs> <laughs> You're just getting started. All right, we'll come back to that. Um, is there, oh, actually, before we do, is there something you can name, some specific thing about the, the president's philosophy or even his behavior that you can say, I categorically deny that. I am not in favor of that and, and distance myself from that. I mean, most, most viscerally is the communication style. Um, I, I believe in a, you know, it, I, I expect a different sort of comportment from the commander in chief and from the office. Um, and, and while that's, you know, a style point and not a policy point, um, you know, it is, it's very important for a lot of people. And, you know, he role models behavior around the world. Um, I wish the tweets would stop. I wish there was uh, a, a little more of reaching across the aisle and, and listening and compromise. Um, yeah. Would you withdraw from NATO? No, but I but I do I do agree with the with the debate that he's uh, brought up about countries paying their fair share, um, and there was a lot of resistance in the beginning when when he forced countries to you know sh 
put up or, or get out basically. Um, but as a result, other countries have increased their level of, of contribution to the NATO military alliance. And, and I think that's a great outcome. Okay, your turn, Drake. So Drake, I don't think, again, it would be, um, it would be naive of us to think that, that Joe Biden or, or the Clinton wing, as it's sometimes referred to, of, of the party is in control of the party, um, of the Democratic Party, that is. It's pretty obvious that, I mean, same thing as on the Republican side. You have pro left wing progressives challenging long term incumbent Democrats, AOC uh, being the, the, the first of, of what are now many of those kind of uh, primary challenges that we see, which is essentially the mirror image of what we see on the, on the Republican side. Same question as I asked uh, Fiona, where do you fall on this? Where, if, if, you're, if you're saying I follow this wing of the party or that wing of the party, where are you on that uh, continuum? Well, I, I told you this before, my ideology, I'm a Democrat, I've been a Democrat my whole life. I'm a very proud Democrat. I'm gonna push back on you a little bit. I don't think that, uh, I mean, Joe Biden is our nominee. Uh, we have a very moderate platform. Uh, we certainly don't apologize as a party, even though this is really about a local District 72 race. Take someone like AOC, who in, in the Fox universe, I guess, is somewhere between you know Satan and uh, uh, you know Leon Trotsky. But the bottom line is, is AOC is very representative in a direct democratic way to the residents of the neighborhood in Brooklyn where she comes from. So she is simply the people you see are elected are the people by and large. Um, you know, that speak with a big variety of voices. We have a very, very vibrant party. It's very inclusive. And we are not, you know, um, tied to one great dear leader that must be, uh, never be uh, offended. And, uh, you know, we actually push back. And it's a lot of leadership we've had uh, in the Democratic Party, uh, which I think has produced the result we have, which is a fantastic presidential candidate. We've got in, in Florida right now, don't forget, for the first time in 15 years, we have Democrats that are challenging Republican strongholds at every single district in Florida. And there's a reason for that, because people are tired of what's been going on. Um, I, I believe that, the, you know, I understand that Ms. McFarland indicates that um, the one thing she doesn't like about Donald Trump is his communication style. It isn't a communication style to make fun of um, uh, veterans. And it's not a communication style to make fun of disabled reporters. And it's not a communication style to ignore science. Right. So, I, I understand. I, I really am just looking for your philosophy. So following up on Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, for those of you out there who don't think I know her name, is, you know, there are a lot of things. These do bleed down to local issues. So for instance, defunding the police was a huge issue over the summer. It hasn't come up as much lately, but you're going to be in the position of being asked that question on these local type issues. Obviously, uh, that wing of the party is has espoused that type of philosophy. Joe Biden has not. Where are you on those types of issues? Defunding the police, it changing the rules of the game as we go forward. Defunding, defunding the police is... No, no one in Sarasota in District 72 wants to defund the police. Defund the police is a misnomer. Um, I have had a long history with the police in Sarasota. Uh, I, I worked, as I said, with, with Kurt Hoffman, the new sheriff, and I thought he was going to be a great sheriff, and I support him totally. What I can tell you, though, is, is that the police are being asked to do too many things, and they have, in many cases, sometimes the wrong people, because the sheriffs, for example, and the police chiefs, they don't have what they need. They don't have the tools to be able to fire like any other organization. Uh, people who, frankly, have no business being police officers. So we need to, I believe, and we also have a mental health component. I think the police are asking for a lot of things that they should be doing. So in other words, I don't, I'm not buying into the narrative that for some reason Democrats want to defund the police. That just isn't true. And I'm certainly not someone that's going to advocate for the defunding of police. I am very happy, uh, by and large, with the results of law enforcement here in Sarasota and in Sarasota County. So, all right. So, so let's apply some of those philosophies to specific uh, things. Um, number one, on the ballot this this time around is a one. I think it's referendum three is the one to um, change the way primaries are done. Uh, we've got open versus closed primaries. Um, I don't know if it's going to pass or not. Um, but right now we have um, a primary system in which. They're closed essentially unless there are no other candidates. Drake, we'll start with you. Is that a is that a good system, a bad system? And specifically, if you're in the legislature, 
uh, are you going to vote to continue to fund closed primaries? In other words, if it's a Republican only primary or a Democratic only primary, why is the public paying for that? We don't pay for the, for the Kiwanis to elect their president. Why would we pay for the Republicans to elect their standard bearer or the Democrats if it's still a closed primary system? We'll start with I you. Think the matters. I think that we need to have, I mean, whether we like it or not, uh, you know, like in our district right now, about a third of the voters that Fiona and I are trying to get to vote for us are no party affiliates. So I consider them political agnostics. In other words, are people with one or two issues okay, that they may, they may think are important. And, I'm sure Fiona's run into them, I've run into them too. Um, if you're on the wrong side of that, they don't, they're not really happy with it. But I think to on-ramp, for most people to access the system, there needs to be a Democratic primary and a Republican primary. And what I want to make sure happens, though, is, is that qualified candidates through local gerrymandering of districts, like what, you know, like what happened with Fred Atkins, um, that should never happen, where someone has to file a federal lawsuit uh, to try to run in a race in a, in a, a county he's lived in his whole life. So uh, that's the kind of shenanigans that I want to make sure get resolved and are prohibited. Fiona, back to yes. you. The amendment is called "All Voters Vote," uh, which is which is you know a lofty ideal, uh, but I think the language of the of the amendment is a little bit different, and it and it's um, you know it's not sort of what we're talking about here, which is bringing in the MPAs into the primary process. Um, it's, you know, it also referred to as a jungle primary where the top two go vote getters in August will go on to November. Um, and there's, you know, there's interesting retrospectives that have been applied to various races around the state and how that would have, if this amendment was in, was in place, how the races would have um, played out. Uh, so I'll, I'll be clear, I'm not in support of that amendment. Um, but I would be open to allowing these NPAs and these independents uh, to participate in the primary process. And, you know, there's, there's some, some, some states around the country and some areas around the country that do this and seem to be doing it quite well, which is to allow the independents to um, indicate which party they want to participate in a primary for. Um, and I can see that being something as nimble as, you know, if there's uh, candidates that you really have an opinion about, these independents can uh, select that to be the party in which they vote for a primary cycle and, um, you know, I think there's, I think there's something to be explored there, uh, but that's separate from the language that's in Amendment Three right now. Okay. Um, going back to you, Fiona. So, and, and sticking with these procedural issues. So, voting by mail has been in the news a lot um, nationally, anyway. Um, now, Florida uh, has actually a slightly different vote by mail system, and kind of curious as to your views as to the efficiency of it, the uh, effectiveness of it. Kind of whether you're a, a supporter of our system versus not, um, kind of what's good or what's bad about it. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, I'm quite proud of our vote by mail system um, and, and particularly here in Sarasota, I think that our supervisor election, Ron Turner, does a great job with it and so do his team uh, of volunteers. Um, the reason why ours is uniquely good is because you opt into it. Um, so you, you have to renew it every couple of years. Uh, you, you indicate an intent to vote. Um, you're ensuring that the ballot is going to an address at which you currently are at. Um, so I think it's, 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 it's quite, uh, it's quite fair. It's quite safe. Uh, and I, and I am proud of it. Great. That may be something that Fiona disagrees with the president on. We may have found something else, but I, I do agree very much also with my opponent. I think that particularly when it comes to Ron Turner. He is a singularly, uh, he has a tremendous amount of integrity. And I think anyone who ever runs for office in this county will, will say we brag about Ron Turner uh, as a supervisor of elections. But the vote by mail, I believe even should be expanded even more. I think it's highly democratic, particularly in a, in a state where we may have an elderly population that doesn't, you know, even at, not at a non-COVID time, we'll be able to access to the polls. I think it's very important uh, and, and very well done system. I would like to try to actually expand vote by mail. All right, speaking of expansion, so a couple of years ago, we went through a debate back when Governor Scott was in office about Medicaid expansion. Um, it looks like regardless of who wins the election, this may come back to the legislature um, when one of you is elected. Um, Drake, we'll start with you this time. Um, where are we on, where are you on the idea of Medicaid expansion, which did not pass last time, um, and when it comes back up again? 
Medicaid has to be expanded in Florida. We have no real alternative for uh, millions of Floridians, for not only the poor and uh, elderly, but also for uh, children who desperately need uh, an expansion of it. There has been a war. Uh, there was a war by Rick Scott, frankly, on the healthcare system and on Obamacare. Uh, he and Pam Bondi, you know, they, they, they filed innumerable lawsuits to try to derail it and destroy it, and they resulted in weakening uh, what should be a very robust insurance um, economy, and, and, you know, but we never got that chance. So I think it's very cynical not to expand Medicaid. Um, we definitely have the funding for it. We need to do it. And, uh, you know, healthcare is a right. It's, it sounds trite, but it is, especially right now with COVID going on. We have so many people losing their insurance, their health coverage from their jobs. You know, there's 500,000 more people out of work now than there were before COVID came. So we've got to do everything we can as a legislature to step in and make sure that Florida is protected. Whoops, follow up question, because this is what I think was the center of the debate last time is, you know, the way it was set up last time was there was a period of time in which it would be completely subsidized by the federal government and then a point at which it would be not be. How would that get paid for, especially given the budget pinch that we're going to have coming up? Well, I mean, the, the whole question presupposes a responsible federal government in regards to health care. And, and I'm not being flippant, it's true. What, that should be, and it's, it's usually set up where we have matching funds from the federal government, vis-a-vis -vis through Medicare, but we have that matching funds that the states can use for Medicaid. It's obvious we are going to have to resolve that problem. But again, the legislature has a responsibility to do everything they can to provide uh, expanded health care, at least as an option, basic health care, to people who most desperately need it. So that's gonna to have to be something that we are gonna to have to make sure occurs. And that's gonna to have to be part of kind of our COVID reconstruction, I think, going forward in the next couple of years. So I don't have a, I, don't, I can't sit here and say, this is exactly how we should fund it, but the fact is it has to be funded. And we need to stop pretending that there aren't insurance industry lobbyists that are preventing that from happening. So that's just something that is a non-negotiable uh, part as far as I'm concerned. The, the responsibility is too great on the part of the state. Fiona? Um, I, I, from a principal standpoint, I'm, I'm against e expanding uh, Medicaid. But what I do want to say is that I, 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 we need to be compassionate in the wake of this virus. Um, I, I believe that we should provide the best quality care at an affordable cost that encourages people to be seen earlier in their health journey. Um, and that's the overall lens through which I view legislation. Now, if, you, if you've been working hard your whole life and paying into a system uh, that you expect to be there for you when you when you get old, uh, it, it, we should keep that promise. Um, conversely, we should also be taking care of those who need help. Um, that's sort of the, the philosophical standpoint through which I view legislation as, as we you know move forward from this and have the healthcare debate up in Tallahassee. Um, if the, I guess a follow-up question to you then is if we don't expand Medicaid, where does that compassionate safety net come from? Where, where is that going to be available to people if, if it's not through Medicaid expansion? You know, there's, there's some, there's some creativity that we've seen, uh, you know, work well in other states about, uh, incentivizing private sector, incentivizing, um, not-for-profit organizations to step forward. Um, that's something I'd be interested in, ex in exploring further, um, just as an example. Okay. You're on mute, Morgan. It's, it's like the world we live in. Um, okay, so another issue that is going to hit you guys, I think, in your first session, probably when you get up there is, and I'm switching gears into some environmental issues now, um, is the toll road. Uh, actually, two toll roads. Um, one is supposed to run from essentially Citrus County up to the border. The other is going to go from kind of mid Polk down to Collier. And then there's a little a squiggle that goes from the turnpike over to, uh, to the west. Um, I mean, obviously some people think that this is uh, a, a lifeline to underserved communities. Other people feel like you're now uh, opening up the last wild areas of Florida. Um, so we'll start with you, Fiona. Uh, where are we on this? Uh, it's a huge project, billions of dollars, years and years of, of, uh, of work. What are your thoughts and why? So I'll start at the big view and I'll narrow down, but from a, from a, a, a 10,000 foot view, 
this is the sort of stuff that that the political system often gets wrong in that it is a long-term plan. It extends past the political cycle. It extends past, you know, the two-year election cycle for us in Tallahassee. Um, and it's a big long-term plan. Now, I think what's lost in the debate when people say, oh, it's a toll road to nowhere. It's, you know, the, the, the strap the taxpayers with uh, massive debt and all this stuff is that FDOT actually can't continue with it unless it's financially feasible. So every year as this comes up, there will be scrutiny and oversight uh, and accountability towards building it. And if the business case is not there, it will not be done. But uh, and now as I get more narrow in, in answering this, you know, economic prosperity and technology, technological advances in our rural communities uh, is important. Um, and these roads would bring uh, wide ranging infrastructure improvements to those areas, whether that's, you know, from a utility standpoint, everywhere from sewer, water to broadband. And we're having this debate on the internet right now. Many of our children are, are doing online education. And if we look to these rural communities, you know, even through the squiggle that you mentioned, developing these roads will bring some, some great utility improvements to these areas. Great. Right. Is it a road to nowhere or something that needs doing? Yeah, I don't understand that. I mean, I don't know how it's how it's limited government to spend billions of dollars over the next, what is it, 18 years on a toll road uh, that I don't think anyone really thinks is going to serve anyone other than the people who have secured the concrete and asphalt contracts, uh, particularly right now what's going on in, in uh, with COVID. We need, all of us as a state, need those billions of dollars here in our state to fight COVID and help us reconstruct from this. I have driven actually through every county in Florida in my life. It was something I always wanted to do and I did. I am very familiar with the inside of the state. I know about the rural areas. I agree we need to have broadband in places like Arcadia that is reliable or in, uh, in the middle of the state and, and all over in the panhandle up in Washington County, for example, uh, where they only have about 8,000 people in the whole county. But the truth is, is we don't need to have a giant toll road uh, that will settle us with debt. And not only that, it'll settle us with tolls, uh, which are, are you know, really just a tax to use something. And also environmentally, it will be a disaster because what you're really doing is putting an enormous asphalt raised bed fence, a barrier that will cut into most of the habitats and uh, really impact clean water. So it is not only going to be an economic disaster and not a necessity, we need that money to fight COVID, um, but it also is going to be an environmental danger. And I think that, you know, every environmental group I've spoken to, nonpartisan or not, says that and they agree with that. So I don't know what the hurry is. I don't know what promises have been made to lobbyists. I'm not sure what's really going on, but if it doesn't make sense to us, you can pretty much guarantee that there's a reason for that and that there's been a deal that's been made. And that's exactly what we need to try to stop up in Tallahassee. Hey, um, kind of a segue to that actually is, so um, one of the things that happened recently with the Florida Forever program was there's a, there's a provision of the Florida Forever program called the Rural and Family Lands Program. You guys are probably familiar with it. We actually have benefited that a lot here in Sarasota. We've got a number of big tracks that have uh, been subjected to conservation easements so that the family can continue to ranch and, and so on, but not be developed long term. Um, that uh, program has been essentially zero funded since uh, 2018. Um, I guess the first question I'll start with you and then go to Fiona um, is, is number one, why do we think that is? Um, I understand now COVID, but, but, but you know, it's been, been a while now. Why do you think that is? And, and how do we get that fixed? How do we, um, uh, how, how do we redirect that so that we get back to where, where it was before? And we'll start with you and then go to Fiona. And, and I believe it or not, I'm not trying to make this partisan, but all I can say is that the state's been run uh, by the Republican Party, all three branches for the last 20 years. The truth is, and it's very simple, uh, Florida Forever was passed by an overwhelming majority of Florida citizens who wanted to make sure that the wild places in this state that are so valuable to our water quality, uh, our way of life, our children's development, that they are preserved. Okay, it's very simple. And the legislature was given a very direct instruction to appropriate enough money to make that happen. And they are supposed to be doing that and they're not. 
And the reason why is because their Republican developer donors view it as a threat to land acquisition, to driving prices of land up. And frankly, they resent not being able to come in and build and pave wherever they, will, wherever they want to. And that's the truth. There is no other reason why a group of legislators that supposedly have your best interest in heart as a Florida citizen and my best interest would do anything other than throw as much money as they could into Florida forever to preserve these spaces other than they're getting pressure from whatever lobbyists or whatever developers that are pressuring them not to do it. They have looted this program since its inception. They have refused to follow the will of the voters. And all I can tell you is what should be happening is, is everyone should be raising hell about this because it goes directly to the heart of really what's great about this state. Those rural areas you're talking about, those are some of the most beautiful areas in Florida, but there's also so many places in Florida that are in danger simply of being paved over and another zero lot line of condominium going up on it. We don't want that. We don't want to live in the middle of a zero lot line sprawl. And the citizens have made this very clear. So again, this is another, uh, you just need to look at who the donors are and who the people are that are telling the Republican legislators that they should not be following the rule of the people and the Constitution. So if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm going to demand that this program be adequately funded. And if I end up in the minority, I'm going to demand, hopefully with my constituents here in 72, to explain why if Fiona wins, why Fiona isn't also demanding that. Why isn't Joe Bruders leading the charge on that? Why isn't the governor doing that? Because there's no other reason other than saying Florida is for sale. And that's what's been happening in the last few years. So uh, Fiona, I'm going to come to you uh, as well. I just want you to know, you'll be happy to know that the consensus seems to be that, that uh, people love you guys. They seem to hate me today. So um, good for you guys. You guys are doing great. Our little experiment is working for you, but not so much for me. Uh, Jennifer, uh, it's to you. Florida Forever, uh, specifically this issue of the Florida uh, family and rural lands uh, zero funding issue. Yeah, I, I think I'll just ratchet it down and, and, and maybe take a little uh, air out of the argument that I'm a stooge, but I mean, this Republican supports fully funding Florida Forever. I like that. By the way, I also like the fact that you guys are not abusing your time. I'm giving you all the time you want and you haven't abused it. So, uh, so good for you. Um, uh, the shifting gears a little bit and we're, we still have the pandemic to get to. Don't worry if, if people are out there asking questions. We are going to ask pandemic questions. Can't hardly avoid it, um, obviously. Um, but we have some other questions. So Florida is a known as a low tax state. Uh, people move here because we don't have an income tax, which is which is terrific. Um, on the other hand, it is not an effectively low tax state. And on top of that, it's a, an extraordinarily top five regressive tax state. 67% of the state budget is made up of sales tax or ad valorem taxation. Is that fair, Fiona? Fiona, we're gonna start with you. Is that a fair way to fund the state's needs? If not, how, are, how would you look to, uh, to try to modify that so uh, it, if, uh, it's either fair or a little bit more sustainable? We'll start with you and then go to Drake. The allure of no income tax in Florida is strong. Uh, and it's, it's, it's part of the decision. Uh, it, was, it was part of my decision calculus when I moved here after the Navy. And I think it's part of many other people's and, and will continue to be so. Um, I, I'm not in favor of changing our, our tax structure uh, going forward in a major way. Um, whether that's, you know, I certainly would not vote to, to bring income tax. I would not vote to increase the tax base. Um, and, you know, with an asterisk that we are in uncertain budget times in the near term here, uh, I, I would not vote to raise taxes. Uh, you're still doing great. You just got two votes for president for each of you. So uh, you guys are you guys are doing well. Um, they, they still seem to hate me, though. Um, OK, next question. Um, we are now to pandemic questions. Um, what is it? And with some specificity, um, what what is it that you can do at the state level to, to help? Um, and I'm, I'm now kind of 
business recovery side, not so much the health side of things. We're going to get to that separately. But on the business side of things, what is it that, that you envision being able to do from the state level to help businesses sort of recover uh, from, from what's been a, a much longer and harder road than I think anyone expected? Fiona, we'll start with you. Uh, so I, I sort of have this like running line in my head called the coronavirus silver lining and, and some of them are, uh, and I refer to these as the interesting things that we've done from a governmental perspective during coronavirus that perhaps we should explore continuing. Um, and these are small things, it's boring, uh, but it's things like permit digitiz digitization. So applying for business permits um, quickly and, and, and online. Um, that's reduced a lot of uh, administrative burden for, for small business. That's something I'd like to continue. Um, there's some other tax forgiveness uh, or stays that have, have been in, um, temporary through the executive order. And, and you know, we got, a little, we got a little case study basically and how those things carried out. And I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of further study we can do that I want to continue there. But frankly, how we get the state back to work is, is encouraging small business, right? What, what, what are these regulations? Can we continue to roll back to encourage people to either start or continue a business here um, and create good paying jobs for folks? Great. Uh, Drake? The way we're going to get Florida's economy back on track is to lead. That's how we're going to do it. We're going, we need to establish COVID strategies to make sure that business owners, the ones that are still left, and their customers and their clients and their employees feel safe from COVID. That is going to require us not to ignore COVID. For example, we need to enshrine some type of mask guidance. And that's a very easy one. It works, works around the world. I think we've seen what happens in the White House, for example, we have testing and no masks versus testing and masks. Masks are important. I've been running a small business here for 25 years, and I understand exactly every day how to make a payroll, and, and COVID has affected our business greatly. It's affected all my friends' businesses, um, and I think realtors are doing well, but every bar owner I know and every restaurant owner I know, it's probably the worst period they've ever had since 2008, so it's been a catastrophe. So we have to stand with our business community, particularly our small business owners, and make sure they have the necessary COVID guidance. They make sure that, very quick example I use all the time. I have a friend here in uh, Siesta Key who's a bar owner. And he told me, you know, there is no statewide uh, mandate from the, uh, Governor DeSantis because he's not following the science. He says, so he allows us to open up the bars. Well, he says, I want, and my servers want them, people to wear masks. The problem is there may be another bar down the street that says, nah, no mass needed, come on down here. Because it's impossible to compete. It's an unlevel, uneven playing ground. It tries to turn small business people into like epidemiologists or something. No one really knows. You know we shouldn't get near each other, but there's no enforcement by the state. I mean, it's very simple and I'll wrap it up, but I have a very simple theory about masks. Any place you can't smoke in the state of Florida, you should have to wear a mask. No one can, you know, why? Because if you smoke in an elevator or a grocery store or, uh, you know, in a closed in area that's public, it will kill the people inside it. Your secondhand smoke will, just like COVID will. No one says their constitutional rights are violated because they can't smoke in a hospital or an elevator or a Publix. And that's because the government led on that. They said there's a public health crisis with cancer and we need to lead on that. It's the same exact thing, so basic. And everyone in Florida, I think, is crying out for it. They are crying out for the depolitization, particularly the business owners. They're saying, please give us some guidance. Give us something where we don't have to be the cops in this. And so it's incredibly important. They need direct financial help. They need, uh, I agree with Fiona on that they need subsidies on that. Um, streamlining, I guess, would help, but we really have got to stand with the community. But I, I say this again, no one is coming to Florida to go to Siesta Key unless they feel safe. We are never gonna get our schools back unless they feel safe. Our businesses are not gonna be where they need to be until they're safe. And that's it. So I want to do everything I can as a legislator to, to promote that. I think it's time we stop rejecting science and politicizing it. And we do whatever we have to do to stand with, you know, my friends in the business community. Because we need help. Um, 
specific question uh, asked, are you in favor of, and we'll start with you, Drake, and then go to Fiona, are you in favor of, of uh, passing a law that would protect businesses from COVID-related liability lawsuits? Yes. That was a lightning round. I didn't even ask for it. Yes, I'm, yes, and that's, and that's a good example. That's all right. It's a lightning round. It's a yes. Fiona, yes or no? Uh, I, I'm not sure that there's been a need for it so far. I actually was I was looking back through some some data and what we've seen in the, in the short time and, and there actually hasn't in the whole state of Florida so far there's been one lawsuit brought about uh, uh, COVID in the workplace. Um, so while I'm in favor of, of, of making everyone feel safe and if, there, if there's a way that the government can do this in a responsible way I would be in support of it. It, it doesn't show so far that that there's a um, that there's a need for it that, that there's a demand for this this legislation. Um, so you know, as a as a small government Republican, I would I would be hesitant to pass a law unless it seemed that there was a need for it. Um, so moving into the health related side of things um, on on COVID, uh, and then we'll move off of COVID. Um, is so. On the health side of things, and uh, Fiona, I guess we're starting with you this time, is two-part question. One is, do you, do you agree with the way Governor DeSantis has handled it? And if not specifically, what things don't you agree with? And what would you try to push if you were elected uh, and up in the legislature trying to make decisions on what to do on a statewide basis? Um, I'll point to a couple things that I thought the governor did well in handling the virus. Uh, so first was was sort of to set left and right limits as, as to what would be allowed. And, and these are things like protecting constitutional rights to worship um, and things like that. And then and then leaving it up to the locality uh, to, to handle the specifics as they saw, as they saw fit. Um, another thing I appreciated was uh, in the Navy, we would have called it warheads and foreheads, but he assigned resources to where they are best needed. Wait, what would you call it? Warheads? On foreheads. Warheads on foreheads. That sounds dangerous. All right, sorry, go ahead. So what, so what I mean by that is the governor, uh, he deployed resources to the, the population that was at most risk, which is our elderly population, um, and really worked with the nursing homes to um, get our elderly who are positive or, or um, uh, tested positive for the virus and isolate them, whether that was on facility, if they were able to were outside of the facility if they did not have the physical structure to do so, uh, and then limit visitation. Um, that was tremendously tre tremendously tough. Uh, and those of us who have elder family members and weren't able to see them, um, you know, have been going through this. But it was a way to quickly care for our most at-risk population. Um, moving forward. You know, I, I think back again, when I was in the Navy, it was it was critical that we had the tools and the resources to do a difficult job at sea. Um, and Drake brought up leadership, and this is something that, you know, I think of often, but uh, I, I started in the Navy during the financial re recession and then the ensuing budget department, uh, St Department of Defense budget cuts. And it was important that we had the resources we need to do a difficult job. And I see that again today, our frontline workers and our essential personnel need the resources to effectively do their jobs, whether that's teachers uh, working with students who are struggling with the di digital divide, whether that's public, public safety officials grappling with you know, protests or a deterioration in mental health, um, or our essential workers that are coming home exhausted at the end of the day. Um, I think any politician that tells you they have the answers to how we solve this going forward is, is full of it. Um, because as much as you can try to prepare for this job and hope that your past experiences have set you up, um, it's the circumstances of the job that will dictate how you perform. I'm sorry, am I up? You're up. I agree with, with Fiona, the circumstances of the job in this case did dictate what DeSantis did, which was virtually nothing. The circumstances of his job is that he owes that job to Donald Trump. And we all remember that instead of being our governor, uh, he made sure we made the pilgrimage up to Washington to find out what Donald wanted. And then he came back here and suddenly we had Donald Trump as the as the uh, the governor. So 
I am not here to tell you everything that I think should be done in a magic wand. I am saying that I want actual responsibility and leadership from the governor and from the Republican legislator, legislature and the Republican Party of Florida. I mean, the Democrats have been yelling about this forever. But what we need to do is, is we've got to reestablish what the role of government is. Limited government is, is, is an interesting idea, but there's no time for limited government when we're in the middle of a massive pandemic. We are going to cross in Florida the 15,000 death count probably this weekend. In Sarasota, I think as of today, I want to get it right, I think there's 274 Sarasotans who, who died of COVID. Um, did, is that the responsibility of the governor? No, it's a natural pandemic. But what, what is the responsibility of the governor is not being having the tools and the resources he needs. Some of that's, of course, to blame the federal government for not supplying it to him. But we don't have any kind of testing that we need from the state. That is the role of government. We need to have the testing in place at schools, at businesses. We need to have PPE back order on standby. And we need to have the governor look at his mentor and say, I'm sorry, my duty and obligation is to the citizens of my state. And masks need to be worn. If you can't afford a mask, they need to be provided by the state. These are very basic things. And our healthcare system needs to be completely expanded right now. We also have to deal with our unemployment crisis. That's another fiasco that's happened in the last four months. So while I agree with you that if any politician says that they know exactly what to do, that they're lying to you, I think if any politician says that this has been a well-handled uh, situation with lots of leadership, is also not telling you the story. They've been living in a completely different state than all the rest of us have uh, since February. Okay, since I, I ask everybody, lightning round, start with you, uh, Drake, and then go to Fiona. Mask mandate, yay or nay? Yay. Fiona. No, but you should wear a mask. All right, so this is a little bit of a, it's a little bit of a change, but it's, um, but actually kind of akin to what you were just talking about uh, with the, the mask mandate. And it, it deals with home rule. Um, we've seen over the, not so much the last session, but Every session for about five or six years, there was some uh, there, there was some bill passed that had to do with telling cities or counties uh, what they could do. So whether it was uh, uh, access to beaches or, or plastic straws or uh, you know or even rentals, uh, uh, the, how to do uh, rentals, um, there always seemed to be something that came up. What's your philosophical view of the role of the legislature in Tallahassee as it relates to home rule and, and that type of legislation that seems to be so much more common uh, these days? We'll start with Fiona and go to Drake. Sure. I, I'll, I'll add an answer on the front end here, which is I think people are tired of the, of the political, of the partisan bickering and the blame casting. And, you know, I think the home rule discussion often comes down to whose party is at fault. Um, but here's the answer. The government closest to the people is often the one that is most effective and understands the circumstances on the ground. Um, it's also the government that's closest to the people that they can reach out and, and, and touch. Um, it, the, the districts are smaller. You actually know your legislators. So I do support home rule. Um, but they're, what happens often in, in policy is we have a, a backwards looking or emotional reaction to passing legislation and passing laws. And they seem like a great idea and they feel good and, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm certainly not trying to diminish them. Um, but when we pass laws that will be enforced and have an impact on people's lives into the future, we should be careful that we're planning for the, for the unintended consequences. And, and I think that in cases where um, you know, the state, the state has tried to supersede home rule. It's come down to that. It's been a, 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 home, a home law that is an emotional reaction um, that if extended across the state would have, would have different sort of impact. Um, so that's, that's my political way of saying that it's, it's not black and white. It's not home rule or, or, state, or state control. There's a nuance and a dance between it. Great. Uh, I think I think she's in the main correct. I, I think it's a more nuanced question. It really does depend, you know, when the Democrats were in charge of the legislature in the, in the 80s or the 90s, and the Republicans were in charge more of local government, 
The Democrats were against home rule. I mean, each legislative body wants its own power. It's part of the nature of government. They want to kind of expand that. And they also want to be accountable to their citizens. You know, someone, if you're a county commissioner and someone's coming down, uh, raising, a, you know, having problems, you want to address the needs if the state isn't. The problem I see with it, frankly, much more is the other way. I, I see the abuse of, um, actually, I, I think I see the takeover and the unnecessary influence in local governments of very specialized, highly financed constituents. Like, I, I mean, in Sarasota, that's what we have here. We have a county commission that is highly influenced by developers. And so who care? And nothing against developers. Developers can do whatever they want with their, with their property. I'm a big believer in property rights. My only thing though, is I think that a lot of times, for example, their interests do not um, dovetail with the interests of the majority of the population. So what I do worry about with home rule is that sometimes that we get less democracy instead of more. When you have people who, citizens who, for example, en masse say, show up at a county commission meeting and say, we don't want this. And the county commissioners look at them and they have a conflict of interest and they ignore them. That's happened in Sarasota County. That's not a secret. So it, it is, Fiona is correct. It is a nuanced question. It's not a matter of on or off. I think that you don't want local governments violating the constitutional rights of people. I think the state has a, a reason for, you know, a way to intervene with that and you should. But, uh, you know, conversely, I, I do worry about the influence of just very limited, powerful groups of people who can make policy at the local level. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a direct answer. That's as, that's as expansive as I can be, on my opinion. Hey, listen, this is our grand experiment with today's debate is we're welcoming nuance. We love intellectual um, debate. Um, and so I'm, I'm all for it. We'll see how the reviews come back and maybe it'll never happen. Maybe it'll never happen again. We'll never have nuance. Um, but I, I think people will learn to, will learn, will learn to love it. Um, next question. Um, and, and this has to do a little bit shift of gears to school choice. Um, and we'll start with you, Drake, and, and go to um, uh, Fiona. Is, you know, this issue, of, this goes all the way back to Jeb Bush uh, and, and has been back and forth for years now. What are your thoughts? Talk about a nuanced area, by the way. What are your thoughts about, about school choice? And, and, you know, you can work in uh, the, the charter school system as well, however you want. Um, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's going to be a little nuance. I feel education is one of the, the, the planks of my platform. I feel incredibly uh, lucky, and I've said this many times. Uh, my children, and I say this true, they got world-class education, they just did. They got educations that in a lot of other states you would have, to, and in some counties, you would have to frankly go to a private school to get the kind of education that uh, is available in District 72. So that's, non, that's also a non-starter for me. Any attempt to um, dilute the education system we have here is just, I'm going to do everything I can to prevent that, period. Um, school choice, I think parents have a right to choose schools generally. We need to support public education. We need to support it at every level. Everyone says that, but I mean, we need to fund it. And in Sarasota, we have done that effectively. When I came here, you know, years and years and years ago, the teachers were excellent, the parents were excellent, but the school buildings were terrible. They were full of lead and asbestos. They hadn't been changed. Nobody wanted to pass a bond initiative because we had a lot of retired citizens here who said, I don't have kids. Why do I need to have a, you know, pay for schools? Until we finally, the citizens finally looked around and realized how valuable education was, that's when we got the sales tax that now makes us such an incredible, outstanding um, uh, school area. And that really shows you the benefits of solid, dependable, stable funding. Uh, we need a funding mechanism to make sure now, I'm also, believe it or not, I believe in charter schools. If a group of people want to get together and they want to run a nonprofit charter schools to address the needs specifically of their children, I'm generally in favor of that. I am absolutely not in favor of for-profit uh, charter schools. I do not think that public education should be, should be sacrificed for charter schools. And I think charter schools needs to, need to have qualified teachers who are professionals, not just volunteers from wherever they come from, I think we need to make sure that we have the same educational standards, the same constitutional rights of the students have to be protected on gender, on uh, religion, et cetera, if they're gonna take any public funding. And I think we have to be very aware, again, I come back to the fact is there are members of the Republican legislature who sit on the board of directors of for-profit educational schools, um, you know, that, are, that use our tax dollars, the money they take out of your pocket uh, to fund their business endeavors. So there are massive conflicts of interest that are going on in the legislature right now. And that's not a secret. So I do believe education is the number one on-ramp, period. 
to the society. It is, it is an educational and constitutional right of everyone. It's the one job the state must do for its citizens to educate the children. So, and also as a closer, I, I will say that one of the greatest reasons to move here, I don't think Fiona had children when she moved to, to Manatee County, but in Sarasota County, we have, you know, it's a huge value add. People who come here to settle and live, one of the first things you look around is what are the schools like, you know, and that's something that retains and keeps people here. So I, uh, you know, I, I'm a huge believer in it. I think any, any attempt to kind of dilute it or steal from it or break it down, you know, I'm against. And I want to make sure the charter schools give a great education uh, to their students that's equal, um, at least, to what they could get in a, in a great local public school. And we need to pay teachers more. <laughs> and we need funny. what? And we need to pay teachers more. <laughs> they, they, waited, they waited too long for the raise. The one they got wasn't enough. And we need to be subsidizing them for purchases that they make on their own for their students. There's no other job in America. We require people to buy their own stuff and bring it in. Um, they're, they're a miracle, they're miraculous. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a fan and I'm also the son of a public school teacher. So I know what's I, I, I am also the son of a public school teacher and I just wish they'd done it 35 years ago when I was in high school. So, Fiona. Um, I think if I could take a, a moment here Morgan, and I think it's in keeping with the with the intention that you've set for the day. But one of the things that's attractive to me about District 72 is, is they vote a split ticket, which is to say that in, in some cases they vote for a Republican and others they vote for a Democrat, um, which was part of the appeal for me in running for this, because that tells me that the citizens of Sarasota will vote for the person, not for the party. Um, and I and I you know, I loved your, your asking us about the, the men at the top of the ticket at the start of this, this debate, um, and then giving us a chance to, to show that, that we're a little bit independent from it. And, and what I'm, I don't love to hear is, is the partisan blame casting. And I understand that I'm in the political game and, and therefore I must carry the sins of my party. Um, but I regret, the, I regret the blame casting, the writ large blame crest, casting on a, on a party as a whole. Um, but I'll pivot now to answer your education question. Uh, I, I, I'm proud of the, the historic the historic raise in teacher salaries that made us number two in the nation um, on teacher salaries, and, and I would support additional education funding, uh, absolutely. Um, but I believe that schools exist to serve the students and not vice versa. Um, students need to be at the center and of the focus of all education policies you know, not buildings or the, or the next new system that's going to make our children geniuses. Uh, and I think that the money should follow the students into the best educational program for them. Um, and those decisions are often best made by parents, um, by not, not by far and distant bureaucrats in some government building. Um, so I favor protecting parents' freedom to choose the best educational options for their children. Great. We got one more question and then I'll give you some time for a, a kind of a closing statement. Um, so last year, well, two years ago, actually, we passed a referendum that allowed felons to re uh, recover the right to vote. Uh, the legislature then in the next session um, made for a, um, uh, an additional requirement um, uh, to pay off all fines uh, that may have been associated with their, their uh, sentence. A lawsuit was filed. I think everybody knows it. I'll try keeping it short. Is lawsuit was filed. There was quite a bit of dis de uh, testimony in that lawsuit about the fact that some of these fines, using air quotes, are not really. It's not really, uh, not really able to figure out what the fines are easily. There's no central database to find out what they are. Each su uh, supervisor is kind of on its own to figure these things out. Some things that count as uh, f uh, fines aren't actually the restitution. They're things like clerk fees and, and recording fees and things like that. So there were a number of things that led to the striking of that statute. That order was subsequently about two weeks ago overturned itself. So we're back to the statute is in effect. Um, starting with Fiona, now that you know more about the, the actual operation of that statute, is there any, are there, sorry, any changes you would make to the way uh, that legislation was drafted? Would you keep it? Would you modify it? What would you do? Uh, the, you know, the restitution is an important part of, of this. Uh, and, you know, as, as, as you all well know, as attorneys, part, sometimes part of sentencing is, is, is restitution or fines and fees, uh, or fines, excuse me. 
So that that is an important part of uh, you know becoming whole, of becoming a citizen again, and, and and that's an important part of the legislation. Uh, we've seen that it's a, it's an absolute monster to 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 have in practice, as you mentioned. It's hard for counties and, and municipalities to track what people actually owe. Um, we got to clean it up. We got to figure out how to how to track this, how to operationally. Uh, carry it out from a from an administrative standpoint um, and, and perhaps adjust the legislation so it encapsulates the, the the robust complexity of the issue great Drake. i i never thought in my lifetime that i would see this piece of legislation but I, what i mean by that is, is the restoration of, of felons rights to vote happen in, in florida and i'm just couldn't be more in favor of it i've said this before Voting, the idea of registering the vote is one of the greatest um, signals as to whether or not you're buying into society and whether you want to participate. And felons who have paid their, their time, done their time, um, they need to be rewarded and of course their rights need to be um, protected. But you know, that's the citizens of the state of Florida. That's the majority of you people. You, you got up and said, we want to give felons the right, their rights restored, something as fundamental as, as the right to vote. The problem with the Republican legislature is that that bill that you're talking about is, is it was just obstructions. It was another example of saying, well, the citizens say one thing of Florida, but we want to say another because I think it's pretty easy to see that they were afraid of what 50 or 60,000 new voters on the rolls who have seen what the inside of government really looks like. Um, I think they'd have to deal with it. So it seems like it was obstructionist. I understand what Fiona's saying about restitution. I think the real issue, the problem though is, is the state of Florida does not know what these people owe, they don't know what needs to be paid, and they don't know who it needs to be paid to. So it's a total violation of the due process. They're saying, we don't really know this, but until this figure that we don't know gets paid by you, you can't vote. And I, I think it's very disingenuous. I mean, we have this, what, we have a, do we have like a bribery investigation, I understand, against uh, Bloomberg for trying to step up and solve this mess? I mean, it's just the same old machine politics preventing the will of the people. So I think you know felons need to be able to vote. If the state can tell them how much they owe as far as their judgment, then they need to pay it. And if they can't tell them, then they shouldn't have to pay. It. And that's just basic fairness. Okay, great. Um, guys, listen, um, I'm gonna give you about a minute each to do your closing uh, arguments. We'll start with Drake and then go to Fiona. If you could though, give me in your closing kind of the one thing you do, your, I, I call it my magic wand. You have your magic wand, what would you do on day one? Um, also, Fiona, we need to thank you for your service. Um, you know, I, there's, there's no doubt that it's a huge sacrifice. You're obviously uh, very talented, could have done anything you wanted. Instead, you spent your time on ships in rough ocean. So thank you for doing that. Drake, thank you for throwing yourself into this, uh, into this mix. I know it's, uh, it's probably really fun and, and stuff, but it doesn't look like fun. So um, I appreciate that you're willing to do it. Um, and I think everybody would probably agree with me on that. To our Tiger Bay members, there will be a poll that comes up at the end, I think. Uh, Jennifer will tell me if there isn't. Um, and, it, and let us know if you like this format or not. I think most of you already have um, <laughs> because you're not shy. But we do want your feedback. And if you liked it, we'll try to do it again. If you don't, you'll never see it again. So uh, who was I going to start with, Drake or Fiona? Drake. Thanks. Drake, uh, give us a minute and tell us your magic wand. Thanks, thanks, Morgan. Thanks, Tiger Bay members. And Fiona, thanks very much for uh, just what Morgan said. Thanks for, for getting involved in the, in the process. You know, um, it's been a tough race, but I, you know, I, I don't doubt you're, you're a person of great character. So um, what I, all I want to do is I just want to address it directly. My magic wand would be to stop the craziness that's going on in Tallahassee if I could. We have got to stop politicizing COVID. We have got to have a group of people that are representing uh, their constituents directly. We just have to. We, I, you know, I want to make sure that the values we have in District 72, which are exceptional here, which is education, the environment, clean water, making sure that people are welcome from all over. We take care of our own in Sarasota. We've always, always have. I want to make sure those values are promulgated. And if I see an opportunity to raise hell and point out conflicts of interest, to point out, um, you know, pay for play type legislation, I want to do that. But I can't change Florida on my own. I can't change, you know, I can change myself, so I'm ultimately responsible for it, but I can defend this district because 
the building I'm in right now is a building that my wife and I created. You know, we, we, we built this out of 25 years. It's a very modest little place, but you know, we work here. We are invested here. My grandchild was born here. My children were all born at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. I'm probably gonna be buried here. I mean, as funny as it sounds, it's true. I love this district. I know the neighborhoods. I know the businesses. I don't have to have it explained to me. I get it, okay? And I want to be your voice and I want to be an independent voice for you. I don't want to have to check with, you know, the president of my political party on whether or not I can do some legislation that I may not agree with. I have no ideology. My ideology is what I believe, my common sense approach to trying to make 72 and, and keep it a great place. So thank you everyone for, for listening. I hope everyone has voted by now. If they haven't, hopefully this is, uh, I would like your vote and I need your support and I need your vote. But I will defend this district, and I promise that I will be the type of legislator that you can be proud of. You can always, always be accessible. And when they get caught, cans of soup. What's that? And they throw the cans of soup. Is there, I don't know what that was, but it, something about cans of soup. Yeah, I don't know. That's I like awesome. It was like SpongeBob came on the scene. All right, Fiona, you're up. That was like the fly, the black fly from last night's. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Um, it, th thank you. This was uh, this was a really really great debate, and of course it happened at Tiger Bay, where these the, the most elevated political discussion can happen. And Drake, thank you for being such a civil counterpart, and, and Morgan, thank you for your humor and style as always. Uh, and thanks for all of you who are tuning in and still listening. Um, it, I commend you for engaging in the political process and, and being informed about who you vote for. Um, I've appreciated the opportunity to, to share what I think and feel a little bit more about myself. And, and I hope that I've said some things that resonate with you. Um, you know, I hope you consider voting for me for, for two reasons. Uh, one is because is my training and my background at the Naval Academy and the Navy have taught me to deal with the, unex deal with the unexpected. Um, you know, when I was out at sea, my officers, as an officer out at sea, and I looked at my sailors, all of whom came from different walks of life, probably had different political ideology, I didn't know. Uh, it was just about getting the mission done. And regardless of what party we came from or where we, we grew up. Um, and second, I, I hope that you'd see me as an investment in the future. Uh, I made it pretty clear through my past and, and you know, by deciding to run that it's about service for me and I've chosen to dedicate my life to serving this country in one form or another. Um, and I hope that you would see that as my dedication to this country. Um, if I've said something that resonates with you, that's great. If not, let me know. Uh, I, my number is, is on the website. I, I, I talk to voters all the time and I'd love to hear from you. Um, it's been an honor to serve, uh, and I just ask that you give me that honor to continue serving in the Florida House. Thank you. Excellent. All right, we've got a poll coming up. Um, it'll be up for about a minute. Thank you very much to all the Tiger members who, who made it. We had another great crowd today. We've got a couple more of these left um, before Election Day, so uh, be sure to, to tune in. Uh, we kept it under our hour and five minutes, so hopefully that, that keeps people coming back. Again, you guys, win or lose, I don't know who's gonna win or lose this race, but I hope both of you stay very well involved for the rest of your, uh, you know, your, your adult lives, basically. So you guys are both a tremendous benefit to the community and we're, we're lucky to have you. So um, make sure you answer the polls. Looks like it's done. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye.